dear family and friends of the Reverend Dr. John McCright. While we gather today to mourn the loss of John, we also gather to remember and celebrate the life and ministry of your father, grandfather, and our friend and pastor. I have known John for these past four, nine years, and in that time he became a very dear friend and colleague. As those who attend the Chapel Without Walls know, John was a frequent preacher and faithful member of our community. And due to his age and health, John did not preach in these past few years. But nevertheless, he nearly always attended our services. Since we began holding worship services here at the Cypress, that certainly did not change. For every Sunday, nearly every Sunday, John was with us, sitting right here near the lectern. Whenever I preached, I could always count on him being there. And that gave me joy as well as inspiration and confidence. I considered him a bit of an anchor for me. And the one time he was not there, I realized just how important that anchor was. I shared this with John a few days before he died. And of course, he smiled at me and nodded, yes. Well, John is no longer in his place. He is no longer with us, at least not physically. Yet I firmly believe that he is and will be with us in the spirit, especially today as we remember him and celebrate his life. May our time together today be meaningful as we give thanks to God for John McCright. And we begin this service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And let us then sing together hymn number one in your hymnals, O God, our help in ages past.
I want to read first from the 46th Psalm. This is the psalm on which Martin Luther wrote the text for his great hymn, Mighty Fortress is Our God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountain tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her right early. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. And then another of the best known of the Psalms, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, who abides in the shadow of the Almighty, who says to the Lord, my fortress and my refuge, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the, the, the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your habitation, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge of you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. I wanted to read something which speaks about someone in old age. And so I chose the last verses of the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes was certainly not called that in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it was called Kohelet, which means the preacher. And in the last chapter, the writer talks about what it is like to get old. I'm not going to read everything he said, because some of you wouldn't want to hear it. <laughs> And at the very end, he says this. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find pleasing words, and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. The sayings of the wise are like goads, 
and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings which are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we come before you today with saddened hearts as we mourn the loss of our dear friend, John McCrite. It is at this moment that we turn to you for comfort and strength, believing in your promise that you will never forget or ever forsake us. We ask that you will be with his children, David, Tim, Bob, Tina, and their children and their spouses. Be with them, O oh God, in a special way. Allow them to remember all the joy, love, and happiness that they shared together, and what their father meant to them in good and difficult times. O oh Lord, we thank you for his life, for John's life among us, and all that he meant and did for so many others as a servant of your church. John was a gift to us, and now we return him to your loving and caring arms with the hope and faith that guided his life while he was among us. And help us, O oh God, to also live lives of caring and sharing with others. And help us always to be reminded of your promise that we are never alone, that you are present in our world and lives. Continue to guide, strengthen, and comfort us so that your light may shine in us and through us, so your name may be always glorified. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us then listen to the words of Scripture as they are written in the Gospel of John, chapters 10 and 21. And in these words, Jesus speaks of himself as the good shepherd, and what a shepherd means and does for his sheep. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, as a father knows me, and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. 
I must bring them also, and they will heed my voice, so there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And from chapter 21, speaking with Simon Peter, Jesus says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. This is the word of the Lord. As clergy, there are several titles by which we can be called depending mainly on the Christian denomination. <coughs> Among them, of course, is the reverend minister, preacher, curate, priest, father, etc. Yet for me, there is one that stands above all others, and that is the title, Pastor. Pastor. Pastor who is a shepherd who tends and feeds his sheep. The Reverend Dr. John McCright was, I believe, first and foremost, a pastor. For he truly cared for the well-being of his sheep. Yes, the Lord is our shepherd. Yet through the centuries of the church, the Lord has called many other shepherds, pastors, to care for his sheep. John McCrite heard that call as a young man and became a pastor in 1947. He told me that a few times, and each time I had to smile at John. And I said to him, gee, John, I was born in 1947, and John had already become a pastor when I was a babe, a mere babe in diapers. Pastor McCright, through those many decades, tended to his sheep. He fed his sheep even as Jesus told Peter to do so. And he did that in his loving amicable and gracious manner. No, I don't believe that it was most important for John to be the greatest preacher, the greatest teacher, or the greatest church administrator. Although I'm sure that he did all those tasks very well. Instead for John McCright, it was to be the best pastor that he could be, to be the best shepherd for his flock. Yes, he was a colleague and a dear friend, but he was also a pastor for me, always showing his interest and loving concern for my wife and for me. So, Dear John, I bid thee farewell, my colleague, my friend, my brother in Christ, Pastor McCright. Amen.
I want to read one more psalm, a psalm of David, and later on I will explain why I chose this particular psalm. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, wilt thou forget me forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. For I have trusted in thy steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. And may the Lord bless to us these readings from his holy word and his name be the glory and the praise. Let me make a couple of announcements. First, the family is not at this service. They knew that they would not be able to get the whole McLean clan together until sometime later. And theoretically, if not actually, that date will be April 6th late in the afternoon on April 6th, which I believe is a Wednesday. The, as many of the family will be there as possible. The service will be held at the Low Country Presbyterian Church where John's son Bob was the interim pastor for a couple of years. We felt it would be good to have a service here for residents of the Cyprus, for members of the Chapel Without Walls, and for any from uh, First Presbyterian or Low Country who might wish to attend. We're pleased that you are here for this service. Following the service, refreshments will be served in the back of the room. On the refreshments table, is a collage of photographs put together by Phil Porter. Phil has known uh, John for as long as John has been here. These photographs are a kind of pictorial uh, summary of the life of John the Crite from adulthood on. I would venture to say none of us here knew John in some of these pictures. <laughs> so you'd be interested to see what he looked like in the old days. And we hope that you will stay for the service at the uh, fellowship time if you can. John and Joanne McCrite moved to Hilton Head Island in 1986. He had then been serving as a Presbyterian minister for 40 years, and they both looked forward to retirement. I was then the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church on the island. The McCrites both became very active in the life of the congregation. At least three times during my pastor at First Presbyterian, John became a part-time minister on the church staff for a year or more at a stretch. If John McCrite were still here, he would be able to tell you exactly how many times and exactly how long it was because he kept records of everything. <laughs> He was the most meticulous record keeper I have ever known. If there was something 
that needed to be done in the church and no one else could or would do it, John would always step forward when asked. What this ultimately meant is that John served the Church of Jesus Christ for an additional 25 years after he retired. 40 years plus 25 years means 65 years of active ministry. That is an amazing record for an amazing man as a Presbyterian pastor. Astonishing longevity. Astonishing man. Joanne became an elder on the first Presbyterian Church session. It was the first time she had ever served in that capacity. By custom, <clears throat> the spouses of Presbyterian clergy do not serve in official capacities in the churches where their spouse is a pastor. But because John was never officially called as an associate pastor in any of these times where he served at First Press or anywhere else in the Low Country, she was able to serve on the session of First Presbyterian. Everything in her background warranted, warranted her to become an elder, and an excellent one she was. She was one of the saints I wrote about in my book, The Communion of Saints, Pastors, Popery, uh, Parishioners. John and Joanne McCrite were among the top three or four minister and spouse duos I have known in my lifetime. Both were exceedingly able servants of the church and each complimented and complimented the other. She was an example of a highly supportive minister's wife, and he was an example of a minister who knew wisely how to utilize her many talents by letting her do her thing while he did his thing. They both had huge genetic and intuitive knowledge of how to get ecclesiastical things done properly. That's not surprising. Both were PKs, preacher's kids. In fact, the <coughs> preachers sprang up through the generations of the McCrite and Gibson families like mushrooms. They both were raised in the old United Presbyterian Church denomination of Scots and so-called Scotch-Irish who came to this country in the 17th and 18th centuries. <laughs> the United Presbyterian Church of North America merged with a larger Presbyterian Church in the United States of America to become the United Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. Presbyterians have wonderfully long titles for their denominations. This occurred in 1958. Joanne's father was a major force in the old United Presbyterian Church. Her brother was also a UPC minister. As John Moline mentioned, John's, our John, John McCrite's grandfather and his father were ministers as is his son, and as were two of his cousins. Back in the day, we used to have an annual PK Sunday at First Press. We would acknowledge everyone who was a preacher's kid, a preacher's parent, or a preacher's spouse. On that Sunday, we would have 40 or 50 people who trooped up to the front of the church. After we would say, admiring words about all of them, we would give them little buttons to pin on their lapel or on their dress. PK for preacher's kid, PP for preacher's parent, PS for preacher's spouse. 
Everyone stood there with their buttons, smiling broadly or sheepishly, depending on their personality. But there were two people who had all three of the buttons. <laughs> Looking like Russian commissars. <laughs> and that was John and Joanne. John McQuite had a throaty, rumbling, resonant voice. It was a very rich bass. He was an enthusiastic, but fortunately fairly soft singer, because he could hardly carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> but I often said that his speaking voice was like the voice of God. And if God's voice doesn't sound like that, it should. <laughs> he was a uniquely gifted teacher, preacher, pastor, and administrator. He kept copious notes on everything that he ever did. As I said, he was a meticulous record keeper. From the day he was ordained, he maintained a list of every child or adult he ever baptized, every couple he ever married, and every person at whose funeral or memorial service he officiated. According to what he told David Lauderdale for David's feature article about John in the Island Packet, when he preached his last of 2,743 <laughs> sermons, and who could ever doubt the authenticity of that number? He also said that he baptized 804 babies and adults into the enormous family of God. He officiated at over 400 weddings and at 475 funerals. The Chapel Without Walls was greatly honored that the Reverend Dr. John L. McCrite decided that he wanted to preach his last sermon at one of our worship services. We had the largest attendance on that Sunday we have ever had in our 15 years of history. John became a computer technology buff sooner than most people even knew, really, that there were computers. And unlike most people who use Microsoft, he used Apple Macintosh, in, to which he had an almost religious devotion. <laughs> Up until almost his dying day, he had his beloved laptop with him, reading this, doing that, playing games. At First Presbyterian, we started out as Microsoft users because that's what was recommended. The pastor didn't care because he had and still has a congenital detestation for anything technological and just wanted to get whatever system we were going to use. Only two people on the then staff of the church preferred Apple, and they were Judy Hillis, who prepared all our communications and is here today and John McCright. But it all worked out smoothly and well, somehow. I need to interrupt this stream of consciousness reminiscence about John McCright to tell you a warning I was given by a certain minister not long after the McCrights moved to the island. I met this person who had previously known John completely unasked, he told me that I must be very leery of John McCrite. I won't go into details, but John had been here long enough, and he had been involved enough in First Presbyterian Church that I was convinced that person had somehow and for some reason misread the nature and the Christian grace of John McCrite. The negative caveat said far more about that minister 
than it did at the Bhagavad Never once did anything the minister warned me about come to pass. John was always supportive, helpful, involved in many activities in the church, collegial with the members of the staff, and with everyone in the congregation. If ever it could be said of anyone with the utmost conviction, it could be said of John McClain, well done, thou good and faithful servant. John was willing to help out where he was needed in Presbyterian churches throughout the low country. He was the interim pastor or session moderator at First Presbyterian Church of Buford on at least two or three occasions. His records would tell that. He taught a Bible study for many years at the Low Country Presbyterian Church in Bluffton after it was formed, and he preached there on a number of occasions, ditto the records. From the first Sunday that the Chapel Without Walls held its first service on January 5th, 2004, John and Joanne McCrite were there. They usually came to the early and only service of the chapel and then went to the 1115 service at First Presbyterian. They generally followed that two service per Sunday pattern for several years until Joanne began to decline with her dementia. Then, when she ended up in the Dogwood section of the Preston Health Center here in Cyprus, John came alone or sat with other friends in our chapel services. For the first 10 years or so, he was the primary supply preacher at the chapel whenever I was away, and I would always hear praises about his rumbling, divine voice sermons afterwards. He attended the forums, which were held after the coffee time each Sunday, judiciously adding his pastoral comments to whatever was being discussed. During the dozen years that we held our services at Congregation Beth Young, he first sat with Joanne toward the back, right over there. Then, when she no longer was able to attend, he sat in the front right, right there. He did that because he could see and hear better, particularly hear, because his elderly ears were not working as well as they once did. When the chapel began to hold its services here at Cyprus nearly three years ago, he always sat in his wheelchair right there. <laughs> There's not a chair there now because our head usher removed it after John died. And it won't be there for a proper length of time in his memory. Sometimes, sitting there in the front row, he would nod off during the service, the sermon. Afterward, he always apologized profusely. Don't worry, John, I said. There are a number of people, much younger than you, <laughs> who nodded at all. <laughs> John McCrite was in church nearly every Sunday for the 35 years I knew him. And when he wasn't there, he was probably traveling. He and Joanne were absolutely in trouble in their travels. He often quietly announced that they had visited over 80 different countries during their lifetimes. When their children were still in school, all six McCrites schlepped throughout Europe one summer, for the whole summer. What a wonderful experience that was for their family especially for the four children, all of whom also became bitten by the travel bug. He loved to recall their travels with great fondness, but particularly that trek across Europe 
in the VW bus. <laughs> I want to tell you about the last 11 days of John McCrite's life because I think it is important for everyone here to hear about it. He was right there in the chapel service on Sunday, February 4th. And that Sunday, he didn't nod off. On Wednesday, February 7th, he was taken to the Hilton Head Hospital with quite sudden and serious medical problems. Because the hospital was full of flu and pneumonia people, he went to Coastal Carolina out in Hardyville. Once he arrived in the hospital, it was a quick downhill slide. It happened that the McCrites' daughter, Tina Roby, was scheduled to come to visit John the very day he went into the hospital. She was there throughout the hospitalization. John was diagnosed with pneumonia and possible kidney failure, plus some other issues. I want you to know what John McCrite told the medical and nursing staff. He said, he wanted nothing done to prolong his life. No IVs, no feeding tube, no antibiotics, no anything. He ate and drank almost nothing in those last days. Eleven days later, he was gone. As with many other lessons John gave us, he also gave us a memorable lesson on how to die. Two days after he went into the hospital, I happened to come to his room when Tina was not there. Not realizing that I was there, he was saying something in his basso profundo voice, but I could only understand part of it. How long? Mumble, mumble. How long? Mumble, mumble. I went out into the hall to call Tina on her cell phone. She was in the hospital cafeteria with Gail McGavick, a very good friend of John and the family, and Tina's host whenever she came to visit John. Tina said they would be back in the room very shortly. I went back into the room, and I found finally figured out what he was saying. How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? He wondered how long this was going to go on. He was quoting Psalm 13. A couple of days later, I thought it might go on for quite some time. He had rallied, and he was conscious and lucid for a couple more days. But he maintained his resolve to have no medical measures taken on his behalf. I tell you this because it took deep conviction about his mortality, coupled with deep conviction about his immortality, to do that. At 94, he did not resist death. Quite the opposite, he welcomed it. What he resisted was keeping him alive in an unlivable life. I will remember many things about John McCrae, but one of the things I shall always remember about him with the greatest admiration is that he chose what he trusted to be a glorious immortality over what almost certainly would have been a ghastly mortality. There can be no certainty that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead or that any of the rest of us shall be resurrected. If we become convinced of it, that conviction is surely a revelation from God. Divine revelations <coughs> pardon me, are not proofs 
or guarantees of anything. Instead, they are inner assurances that God grants us when we hope for sights which mortal eyes are incapable of seeing. John McCrite believed that he would live forever after he died. I believe he is now in that eternal life. And I hope you do as well. What a friend we have in Jesus. And what a friend we had in John McCrite. As Horatio said, at the very end of the greatest play ever written, as Hamlet lay dead on the floor, good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Amen. John's son, son-in-law, I should say, Greg Roby, wrote the lyrics to correspond to a tune composed by Leonard Cohen called Hallelujah. Tina Roby emailed me a recording of Greg's song, thinking that perhaps it could be used in this service. Tina played it for John as he lay dying in the hospital. We decided that for technical reasons, the music would not be heard as well trying to use a recording as it would be if our director of music, Scott Camp, sang the words and the tune. Therefore, he will play and sing both the song and the lyrics. You have before you a copy of the printed lyrics. A Scotsman on his stony crag Pipes to the world that he won't be had While claiming for his clan a hallelujah The veils below do echo with The feelings that his song doth give The plaint and celebration Predestined are those hopes 
Abide and listen to the seed of hallelujah. O presbytery of this core, and here or any distant shore, can know and teach and preach a hallelujah. 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 This one home, or else across the world he'd roam. And yet we know this happened just the same. And once, and with his tots in tow, they ventured forth on that urge to go to share the substance of his hallelujah.
final hymn is hymn number 181. 181, the strength is over with that little